children in here for this special service because I believe it is important for our children to see uh, the sacraments of the church, baptism, communion, all of that. So if it is okay with you, we are going to leave them in here for the duration. I promise, uh, I, I told my staff, I said, I'm not going to preach my normal length because with all the visitors we have, there's a difference between a sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> and so I do not want you to visit and say, well, my God, he kept us till after afternoon and lunchtime. We're not going to have to break bread, I promise. I'm not going to be long today, but I wanted to share some of the Word with you because I don't believe that we should do anything in the church without first delivering the Word. I believe that I believe the Word is more important even than singing. Uh, Martin Luther said that the preaching of the Word is the highest form of worship. So if you think worship's over, it's not. We're just about to take on a new form of worship. So I don't have a particular scripture text for you, but I wanted to share this morning some thoughts before we, uh, before we partake in the sacrament of baptism. Today, I don't know if you know this or not, but this, everybody in this church, you will be attending at least five funerals today. You're going to see five burials, but those five individuals are not going to stay in a grave. They're going to be within a matter of three seconds resurrected into newness of life. Yes, see, I'm speaking obviously of baptism because these five people have decided to make a public declaration of their faith and be baptized in water. And this is a major step in their life because there's nothing more public and honestly there's nothing more humbling than having somebody else dunk you in water when your hair's unfixed, your makeup runs down, and there's nothing more humbling than having to get out of a tub in front of everybody. Can I get a witness? Amen. But they're not doing it today to be seen. They're not doing it today to have anybody applaud them. They're doing it because they want to publicly declare their love and their commitment to the Lord Jesus. Christ. Before we do this, I want to share just a few brief thoughts because we do baptism a little differently here. I'm going to explain to you why. You don't have to answer this question, but I want to ask you, is there something in your life that you wish that you that would die and you could bury it? Is there a season, an event, a, 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 an attitude maybe, something in your life that you wish you could kill and do away with forever? Well, can I tell you that it's possible to live as well as die. It's possible to, have, to bury something but still be alive. Baptism is the proof of that because baptism is all about death and burial. The word baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to submerge or to soak, and it speaks of something being totally engulfed. If you've ever been to a graveside, once they put the casket in the vault and put the vault lid on, they begin to what? Submerge that casket in dirt because they're buried. See, baptism is a grave. It's just a watery grave. Baptism, while it is a sacred time, it is also just as much of a graveside as any other graveside you've been to. Baptism, in its fullest sense, is a funeral. Because something that is being baptized represents something that has died and is being buried. Paul said this in Romans chapter 6. He said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried, say buried. buried. We were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of of sin. See, baptism is all about being buried and resurrected in Christ. It is a declaration not only is Christ in me, but I am in Him. Not only does He belong to me, but I belong to Him. We are now one in death as well as resurrection. See, baptism is all about burying something and being raised and resurrected. Baptism is a declaration that something has died and is being buried so that something new can come. 
See, five, these five individuals are making a declaration that something in their lives has died and they're going to put it to death and bury it. Something in them has been put to death and they're going to place it in this grave and be raised into newness of life. Some of these individuals are being baptized for the first time. They're newly saved. They've just come to the Lord and they're making this a public declaration that they are burying their past life of sin and rebellion and they're being resurrected into a new life in Christ. You see there on the screen it said if we've been united together with them in his death that our old man was crucified and that the body of sin was done away with so that we are no longer slaves to sin. Those who are being baptized for the first time their declaration is I'm not who I used to be. Their declaration today is that old man has died and he is being buried and I am being resurrected. They are making the declaration that Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 17 old things have passed away and all things have been made new they are making the declaration I don't live that way anymore I don't talk that way anymore I don't enjoy those things anymore I'm no longer a son or daughter of the world or the devil I'm a son or daughter of the most high king I've been changed I've been sanctified I've been cleansed I've been made new by the blood of Jesus Christ my my Savior. They're making a declaration that they've been transformed. That they're new in Jesus Christ. Those are the ones making a declaration of their salvation. But there's others who this is not their first time being baptized. This is their second, maybe even their third. And now you may say, I've never heard of rebaptism. Well, I'm going to help you. Because these people, they've been saved for years. They're not, they, 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 they haven't walked away from the Lord. They haven't, they haven't become apostates. They're not sinful. But something's happened in their life. A season has occurred that they want to put to death and they want to bury. See, we've been taught that baptism is a one-time occurrence. That once we get saved initially that we should be baptized once and that's over. I believe that myself until I studied it a little bit. Do you know that baptism is a sacrament? A sacrament means a grace towards the church. And we have many sacraments. One is communion. Now, how many of you have ever only taken communion once in your life? Exactly. Because Paul told us in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, For as often... As you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Often means many times. Even Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. See, communion is not a one and done thing. We do communion regularly. We do communion often because we want to commemorate and celebrate and honor the Lord's sacrifice and death for our sins. The same is also said for the anointing of the sick. James 5 tells us that if any of sick among you, anoint them with oil and pray for their restoration and healing. See, we don't just pray for you one time and say, well, that's it. You've got your prayer. Go on home. No, if you're sick, we're going to anoint you. We're going to drown you in oil, okay? We will pray for you. We will grease you up so much that the East Bruton bus shop would have used you to grease their brakes, okay? We believe in anointing you and praying for you as, as long as you were sick. Are y'all with me? If we can practice communion and the anointing of the sick, if those are often occurrences, then baptism should be as well. See, the Jewish priests, even in the times of Jesus, before they would enter into the presence of the Lord and do their duties, they would dip in something they call a mikvah. And it was a form of baptism. They would fully submerge themselves as a way of burying their impurity so they would be whole and pure and clean before they serve the Lord. In Acts 2.38, when Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, he said, repent. Everybody say, repent. Repent. repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, you do that at initial salvation. But how many of you have had to repent since you got saved? I don't know about you, but you don't ask my wife because she'll tell you. I'm imperfect. I, I mess up. And I have to live a lifestyle of repentance. 
Because how many know that even when you're saved, you're still human? And there's things you get on your life, there's things you allow in your life that would not be pleasing to the Lord. See, the word repent is different than the word confess. Confess just means to verbally acknowledge. But repent means to turn and walk in a new direction. See, even in the church, even Christians have things, where, even have times where we walk in the wrong direction. Where we have bad attitudes. I know it's not just me. Where we have bad attitudes, where we backslide. We get caught up in the world. We go a direction that would not please the Lord. And we have to repent. So the natural conclusion is if I have to repent more than once, change my direction more than once, then shouldn't I be baptized more than once? Yes. See, he said, be back, repent. Repent. That means continue, live a lifestyle of repentance. Paul said we are to die daily. And every time we repent and we're bearing something, we need to get baptized. Now, I don't know about you, I don't have the time to do this. Every, I just baptize myself in the shower sometimes, okay? I just take care of it. But there's times where you've got something that got on you and affected your life. That's why Paul said, I mean, uh, Peter said, be baptized and for the remission of your sins. That word remission means to release. How many know that when you sin or have a season of something, it has effects on your life? That word remission means to release from the effects of. So not only is he saying at initial salvation you are delivered from the power of sin, but you are released from the effects of sin. So when you're baptized the first time or baptized the fifth time, you are burying those sins and saying, I am free from those effects on my life. I am free from the effect of unforgiveness. I am free from the effect of bitterness. I'm free from the effect of backsliding. I have repented. I have changed my direction. And I am hereby saying I am no longer being affected by by that bondage. Amen. Paul said in Romans 6, 7, for he who has died has been freed from sin. That means to a no obligation. So baptism frees you from the captivity and the obligation to sin. Are y'all with me this morning? Amen. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul talks about the Israelites and he said, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Listen, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. See, when Paul is letting us know that when the Israelites passed through the Red Sea, that was their initial baptism. In listen, here's a, here's a type and shadow of salvation. In Egypt, Misty, they were slaves. In Egypt, they were under the dominion and power of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is an is a image of Satan. He oppressed God's people. They were in bondage for 430 years. But when they came out of bondage, God split the Red Sea. And not only did they come through the water, Sister Teresa, but God drowned their enemies. He said they were baptized in the Red Sea. That can be the symbolism of salvation. They came out of slavery and they went into a new season of life where they were no longer slaves and no longer did their enemy have power over them because their enemy was dead. But that was not the only time Israel was baptized. They were baptized again 40 years later when they went into the promised land. Joshua chapter 4 said that Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan. In the midst. Now, you know the story of the Israelites. For 40 years, while they were God's people, they were also stiff-necked, rebellious, complaining idolaters. God was so upset with them that he even told Moses, I'm going to kill them and I'm going to start over with you. That's what he told them. Because they rebelled against God. Listen, because things didn't go their way. They were bitter at God because they felt they should have more than what they had in the wilderness. And so they were backsliding. They were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And God said, this generation will not enter into my rest, but the next. 
So when they crossed over, it says that Joshua took 12 stones. Scholars will tell you these 12 stones were not from the promised land, but they were from the wilderness. Now, why would he get 12 stones, each stone representing one of the 12 tribes of Israel, why would he get 12 stones from the wilderness side? Because the 12 stones from the wilderness side represented their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Those 12 stones represented their past. And it says on in Joshua chapter 4 that when the waters went back together that those stones were covered. So that was a representation that season is gone and a new season has begun. That's a representation we're no longer wandering in the wilderness but we are now entering into our rest. That's a representation that my season of bitterness, my season of complaining, my season of waywardness has now been covered and has now been cleansed. We are no longer rebellious against God but we are God's chosen people that have been designated to take hold of the promised land. See the these stones and the Jordan River were a line of demarcation. It was a line drawn in the sand where Israel could say our past is covered. We wandered for 40 years. We were rebellious for 40 years. Yes, we knew God. Yes, God loved us. Yes, God had, yes, God had his hand on us, but we were backsliding. We were in bitterness. We were unforgiving. We were rebellious, but God said no more. And in uh, Joshua chapter 5 it said that God rolled the reproach of Egypt from them and they named the place Gilgal. The name Gilgal means to roll away. So what God said is, I'm no longer defining you by that past. We have baptized you again and all that has been washed away. It has been put to death and you are now in a new season of life. See, the Jordan River represented this. Their past and their season. So everybody say season. season. Their, their season of waywardness and wandering was under the blood. Amen. See, Paul said again in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, that these things were for our example. So if he said these things were for our example and Israel was baptized more than once, shouldn't we be baptized more than once? Amen. See, anytime there's a season of your life, you want to bury and forget, you can be rebaptized. I won't share their names just yet, but there's one young lady here who had been in church and she said she walked away from the Lord. That's what she told me. She said, I walked away from him, I didn't live for him. She's, but she recommitted her life. She recommitted her life and she said, I want to go all in. I want to make sure that I have made my declaration clear. <laughs> There's another individual here that she's being baptized for an entirely different reason. She had a season of pain, a season of bitterness, a season where she was mad at God. She was mad at God. And she told me, she said, I want to be rebaptized because I want to put that season to death. She said, I don't want to remember that season anymore. I, I want to bury that season and I want to enter a new season. See, anytime there's something you need to bury, you need to be rebaptized. Anytime you have a season you want to forget and be washed away, you can be re-baptized. You may be sitting there thinking, well, how do I know if I need to bury something? How do I know if I need something, if I need to be re-baptized, I need something washed away? Well, let me ask you, is there something that has consumed your life? Is there something that has caused you to stumble in your walk with the Lord? Is there something that has taken your affections off of Jesus? See, Revelation 2, 4 through 5, he's speaking to the church of Ephesus. And the church of Ephesus was one of the largest churches of its time. He said, you're doing well. He said, but I have this one thing against you. You have left your first love. And he said, remember from where you have fallen. Repent. There it is. They're already saved, but he's telling them to repent again. Are y'all with me? Amen. And do your first works, or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That phrase, remember where you have fallen, that's not just backsliding. Listen, that means falling in love with something or someone other than Jesus. 
That phrase, remember where you've fallen? And Ephesus had, fall, had willingly fallen in love with something else. They weren't as passionate about Jesus as they used to be. That left your first love means to voluntarily leave or neglect or ignore. It means a lack of passion for God. That left your first love free phrase means priorities were out of line. Anybody ever got your priorities out of line? Anybody ever been in a season of your life where you focused on something more than you focused on your relationship with God? See, when you're in bitterness and unforgiveness, your main priority is getting even. When you're in pain, your main priority is finding a cure. And that cure could come through various avenues, including drug abuse, alcohol, even relationships. See, when you're in sin and rebellion, your main priority is your flesh and what you want. See, anything can pull us away from prioritizing the Lord first. God's people are not immune to getting out of line. Are y'all hearing me? See, many things can pull us away from God, not just sin, but life. And Scripture says in this, in this verse that if there's ever been a time that we walked away from Him, no matter if it was just for a week, we need to repent and do your first works over. What are your first works? Baptism. Amen. See, I know this all too well because for eight years I struggled with an addiction to pornography. Five of those eight years I was saved and called to the ministry. And while I pursued, while I pursued ministry, my priority was mainly on satisfying my flesh. I don't know if this is too real for you or not, but I'm just telling you, I'm making a case here. My priority was on how I could appease my addiction. And it wasn't until I finally was delivered from that bondage that I got rebaptized because I wanted to bury that season. I wanted to let myself and the devil know that's not me anymore. I was saved and you held me in bondage. I was saved but held in bondage and when I was released from that bondage I buried that season of addiction. So let me ask you this morning, is there something you need to bury? Is there a season you want washed out of your life? It could be a season of unforgiveness, a season of pain, a season of hurt, a season of unbelief, a season of backsliding and rebellion, a season of addiction or sin and failure. It could even be as something as simple as a bad habit, a bad attitude, a bad memory, or even sickness. Can I tell you there is in the Bible a baptism for those who want healing? In 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman the leper went to Elisha the prophet for healing. And Elisha sent his servant and said, tell him to go dip seven times in the Jordan River and he will be cleansed. He thought it was foolish. He said, I don't believe that. And they said, you came all this way, might as well do it. And so Naaman went and dipped seven times in the Jordan River. And the scriptures say on the seventh time, he came up and his skin was as clear and as clean as a newborn baby's. John chapter 5 tells us of the lame man lying at the pool of Bethesda. And when Jesus went to the man at the pool, he said to him, Sister Teresa, do you want to be made well? And his excuse was, I have nobody to put me in the water when the angel stirs the water. Now we know the end of that story is Jesus healed him. But listen, read the scripture. Jesus never once denied that those who got in the water were healed. Read it. He never once said, you're believing something false. No. He, if, since he didn't acknowledge it, then something must have happened. You me tell you what I did this morning? I don't mind telling you. I come over here this morning praying. I had my oil and I went around the rim of this baptismal with the oil and I put my hand in that water, Brother Philip, and I said, God, stir up these waters. I said, God, send the angel of the Lord to stir up these waters because I'm believing somebody here. You came to see somebody 
else be baptized, but I believe the Holy Ghost is going to move on you and you're going to get out of your seat and you're going to come get baptized and God's going to heal you today and resurrect you in newness of life. Participants, you can be dismissed. I believe today that as these five do this, the Spirit of God's going to move. And I believe some of you are going to just feel this urge. And you're going to say, I didn't bring any clothes. That's fine. We got a clothes closet. We can clothe you with what we have. Well, Brother Drake, I didn't bring a towel. I brought five in faith because I'm believing for five more to feel the drawing of the Lord to come and wash something away. No excuses. No excuses. <laughs> So if you have something you need to bury today, bitterness, unforgiveness, a past of sin, backsliding, or just a sickness, you just want to be healed. I believe God, now hear me, it's not in the water. You hear what I'm saying? I'm not going to be accused of preaching some false gospel. There is no power in that water. It's the power of God through the obedience of your faith. But I believe if you'll bury something today, if you'll bury whatever it is that God will free you and He will raise you to newness of life. That word newness means to renew. And that word renew means to make new again and to restore. I believe some people in here need restoration. And I believe that God is not only going to restore you, but He's going to transform you and make you better than what you were. So today we're going to attend five funerals. We're going to bury some things. And I want you, when, when, when they come up, I want you to listen with reverence. Listen to their stories. And when they come up, every time they come up, they're going to sing the chorus of that song we just sang. I am cleansed, I am washed, I am sanctified. After every one, they're going to sing that because we're making a declaration today. And when they come up and they start singing, I want you to applaud just like you applauded yesterday when Auburn and Alabama won. I want you to pretend like that was, a, because that's a field goal in heaven. That's a field goal today because God's children are being set free and they're being washed and they are putting things to death. Yes. So I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. Workers, helpers, if y'all will come on this way. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray for God to anoint this service, for God to anoint our efforts, and for God to do something amazing in this time. Father, I thank you for the day, and I thank you, Lord, for your, your ability and your power in this moment. God, I, I, I count it an honor to baptize these individuals. And God, I count it an honor, Lord, to be their pastor and to share in this moment with them. God, today I pray that as they are dipped in this watery grave, that Lord, when they come up, they will feel new. They will feel like a different individual. And God, today I'm praying you would move in this sovereign moment and do something amazing in the lives of everybody in this room. We pray and we declare all of this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Mr. To go ahead and sing my first participant. Come on forward. Right here. Sister Myrtle, the time has finally come. She's been telling me for, what, two years? She said, I'm going to get baptized. And every time she's gotten, it, gotten the chance, the enemy brought her down. 
And she couldn't do it. But she told me this time, she said, nothing's keeping me down. Amen. And Sister Myrtle, I'm going to tell you, I've prayed for you. I know you've loved the Lord for a long time, but I'm praying that God's just going to heal your body. Yes, You're the main one I've been praying that God let her come out of this water pain-free. Let her come out of this water with whatever's been weighing her down, gone in the name of Jesus. And I am believing today that God's going to set you in a new path, set you with a new anointing, and set you with a new vigor for life and serving Him in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you for Sister Myrtle. I thank you for this precious woman of God who prays for Taylor and me on a daily basis. God, I thank you for her life and I thank you, Lord, that when she comes out of this water, her life is going to be different and things are going to be changed. Lord, I count it an honor right now in the name of Jesus to baptize Sister Myrtle in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I just want to brag on this. Well, you're not a youngin to me because we're really only about, what, four years difference in age. But I'm going to call her a youngin. And you've got a lot of people here proud of you. I see your grandparents. I see your mama, your stepdad, your, your aunts, uncles. They're all so proud of you. But I'm, family, I just want to share with y'all in church. Let me tell you why I'm proud of her. She was texting me the other night, me and Taylor, and she said, how do I get more of God in my life? Yeah, amen. She said, how, how yes, to, amen. go ahead. Yes, and I gave her the usual pastoral answers, and then I gave her my honest answer. I, and, and she can vouch for this. I said, Mary Caitlin, let me tell you, don't chase after no boy. Don't chase after friendships. I said, you chase as hard after Jesus as you can. Yes, and I said, if they can't keep up, you know they're not for you, and you just keep running. Yes, amen. And I believe today that this is her declaration that she's going to keep running. Mary Caitlin, you have anything you want to say? But you believe in the Lord and you love the Lord. I know you do. Family, stretch your hands this way. Let's pray for Mary Caitlin. Father, I thank you for Mary Caitlin and I thank you for her life. And I thank you, Lord, for this, this time, God, that she is going to dedicate herself to you. Father, I pray that you would begin to help her in this walk with you. God, I pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit to be so real on her that, God, when she bumps into people, they'll say something is different about you. Lord, today, as she makes this public declaration. Use her for your glory. And God, help her to go deeper with you than she ever thought was possible. Father, I count an honor and a privilege to baptize Mary Caitlin in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. You okay? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. You finally did it. <laughs> no, this is not the first time. She told me she wanted to do this, and I'm proud of you for doing this. She, I asked her, I said, do you want to say anything? She said, not really. And uh, I'm not going to make her. But I know, she didn't share explicitly, but I know she said, I just got some things I just want to, I just want to bury. I just want to get rid of it. And I, I'm proud of you for making that step. I'm proud of you for just putting people to rest, putting things to rest. Because um, you've, you've been in it long enough to know. You, you, you've been in church how long? I mean, 10 years? 20, I, well, not 20. You're only 27. I don't know. <laughs> but 
anyway, I'm just proud of you. I know this church is proud of you. And uh, we're, we're just looking forward to what God's going to do in your life. So is there anything you want to say? I didn't think so. Okay. Stretch your hands this way if you will. Father, I thank you for Tally. God, I thank you for her life, and I thank you, Lord, for her willingness to be committed to you. Lord, I pray that at whatever she's bearing, whatever she's washing away today, I pray that, God, you, when she comes out of this water, that she'll feel like chains have fallen off of her life. I pray that, God, that you'll give her a new mind, give her a new spirit, Lord, and, God, give her new influence. God, I pray that you would remove whatever it is she needs removed. And, God, when she buries it today, let it not rear its ugly head anymore. Father, I count it an honor and a privilege to baptize Tally in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Those of you that don't know her, this is Ashlyn, and uh, I hope I don't embarrass you, but Ashlyn uh, is the one that Taylor spoke of a few weeks ago that on their women's retreat, she rededicated her life to the Lord. And um, I, I have been so, if I've ever seen a dramatic transformation in somebody that I just met, it's Ashlyn. Um, she, just, she just has this air about her. I don't know how to explain it. She's like a pregnant mama who's glowing. Okay, and even Tally, work, who works with her, said it's, it's just been a transformation. And I, I'm, I'm so proud of you. So proud of you. And I know you've got family, your husband, your grandparents, your in-laws, your mom, all of them, your daughter. And you know, th this is going to be something, she may, you may not think she remembers this, but there'll be pictures. They're taking pictures now. And this will be something that one day when she's a teenager, you'll be able to say, that's the place where I buried it. Amen. You'll be able to attest to her that there's nothing like following after Amen. Jesus. And so we're going to bury that past today. We're going to bury that season because she's not that person anymore. She, she is committed. She is sold out. She don't miss a service unless she's on vacation. And even on vacation, she said, I'm ready to get back to church. I wish other people would have that mindset. Amen. Is there anything you want to say? I know you love the Lord, and I know, I know you're so excited about this walk with Him. Stretch your hands this way. Father, I thank you for Ashlyn, and I thank you for this life. Hallelujah. Ooh. God, I thank you. I thank you that your love is no, is no respecter of persons. I thank you, Lord, that you chase us, God, when we go astray, that you chase after the one and leave the 99. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love that drew Ashland back into the fold and to this newness of life. Father, we buried this season of waywardness. We buried this season when she was away from you. And today, Lord, we dedicate her back to you and we declare newness of life in Jesus Christ. Father, I count it an honor and a privilege to baptize Ashley in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy yes, Ghost. Amen. 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 For those of you that don't know, this is my wife, Taylor. And I'm not going to share her story. I'm going to let her do it because she says I always do all the talking, which is true. But, and she's a crier, so just know it's, it's okay. It's okay. They know. I'm a crier too. 
And so she chokes up a little bit. Now let me tell you, go ahead and just preface it with this. She did not go backsliding, wayward in sin. Okay, she would probably have every reason to do that being married to me. Okay, um, I'm, you know, I'm just thankful to be alive with the attitude that I've had sometimes. But I want you to share with them why you decided to do this. And because I, I think your story will speak to other people. Don't drop the microphone or I'll hold it. Well, I wanted a free t-shirt. Okay, so. well. <laughs> no. um, a lot of y'all know that I had two herniated discs while pregnant with the twins. And um, that was a long nine months. Um, but I, when I had them in April, I had had blood pressure issues. But then when I got put in the hospital to have my C-section, um, I ended up being there for eight days with postpartum preeclampsia. And immediately, um, they had to resort to their last minute protocol, which was to put me on magnesium, which is from the devil. Hmm. Um, and I lost like three or four days um, my blood pressure. Basically, they put me on that to keep me from having a seizure or um, what else? A stroke. stroke. Um, and there was one night that I had a very, very bad, uh, I guess, uh, attack. Yeah, I had a very bad reaction to a medicine, and my heart was beating so fast. My whole body was basically uh, bouncing. Mm -hmm. um, they laid a baby on my chest to get me to calm down, and one of the twins, like, she was literally jumping on my chest because my heart was beating so fast. And I remember thinking in that moment, I was like, I'm going to die. I have a baby at home that... They had brought her to the hospital, but I was so out of it because of the medicine. I, I hadn't seen her in several days. I thought I just had two babies and one at home, and I'm going to die. And um, thankfully, after eight days, uh, they sent me home on six or seven blood pressure medicines. <laughs> um, I'm down to only two, finally. Oh, praise the Lord. Um, but I just don't, you know, there's times where I think that my back is going to be bad again. I wasn't able to do anything with Rachel when my back was down except lay on the couch. Um, there's days that I think that my back's going to get bad again or that I'm not going to, that my blood pressure's going to spike and that I'm, you know, that I'm going to struggle with this forever. And I just don't, I don't want to think like that anymore. I don't want to have those feelings of fear anymore. Um, so that's, I'm just burying that today. Amen. Yeah. I think so. This is what I'm talking about. This right here, I wanted her to share that because so many people think it's just got to be when you backslide, when, you know, if you're rededicated. No, 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 no. You can still be in the fold. You can still be a son or a daughter of the king and have something that you want to bury and something you want to die. Yes. And so today, and I prayed for you, when I stirred my hand in this water, and I won't, I won't even hesitate to say when I stirred it, I got the floor wet because I was excited. Because I really believe that God is going to heal her of her blood pressure. And when she goes back to the doctor, he's going to say, why do we have you on these two medications? You don't need them at all. I'm believing that. And I'm believing her back is already healed. But we're going to seal that today. So we're burying hypertension. We're burying that season of pain. We're burying herniated disc in the name of Jesus. And it's going to be dead. And when something's dead, it has to stay dead. Yes, it does. And so she's going to be a new woman when this is over. Amen. Stretch your hands this way. Father, I thank you for my wife. I thank you, Lord, for my helpmate. And God, I thank you. Thank you for sparing her. Because God, I couldn't do this life without you or without her. And God, I'm thankful that that season of her life and that season of struggle is over. And God, today with our faith combined and with the faith of these people, we're declaring that that season is dead, that season is buried, and that all of these sicknesses and ailments are buried in Jesus' name and that she is going to come out of this water, that she's, this today is going to be a day of change and transformation for her where she is anointed with a new anointing, where she has a new vigor, a new power, 
power in her body and a new power in her life. And that, Lord, as she buries this, she's going to come out feeling free from fear and anxiety and everything else that the enemy has tried to bind her with. Father, I count it an honor and a privilege to baptize my wife in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Anybody else? I'm giving you the opportunity. Come on. Come on, Gary. Find Tyler. It's her daddy. There's one of those towels. Come on, give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. Come on, girl. I've never been baptized. Well, Mr. Gary, it's nice to meet you. Yes, nice to meet you. And I'm so proud for you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you've got a daughter and you've got a family that's proud of you. A mom and a daddy, I see. And, uh, do you love the Lord? Yes, sir. Do you know the Lord? Yes, sir. Is there anything particular you want to, you just want to be baptized. Absolutely. He's never been baptized. So I thank God for this. Yes, and, and, and yes, Tally, you're already being used. Your daddy can't, thought he came to see you get baptized, but he's getting baptized. Stretch your hands this way. Just grab my arm right here and I'm going to put this on your nose. Father, I thank you for Gary. I thank you, Lord, for his love for you and for his commitment. God, I pray that as we baptize him for the first time, that he'll have a fresh vigor for you. Lord, that, God, all the times that the enemy thought he had won, all the times that the enemy tried to take him, I pray, God, you'll restore those years and that, God, he will use those as a witness to who you are and to how great you are and to the power of salvation and to the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we buried this past. We buried these seasons of sin and these seasons that are behind him, and we declare newness of life. And I count it an honor and a privilege to baptize Gary in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I think I have two more towels. Is there anybody else? Don't feel ashamed. If not, let's stand. Brother Ronnie's going to bury something again. Come on, Brother Ronnie. Come on, Brother Ronnie. There's that towel right there. Right behind you. <laughs> Uh-oh. He just wanted to get baptized because I bought a heater for this thing. That's the only reason he wanted to do it. Here, help him get more this way, Chris. Yeah, come up, yeah. I want to redo it, Marty. I want to redo it. He wants to redo it. He's been baptized once before, but he just wants to bury some things. He just wants to bury it. Now, I believe God's going to honor this today. And I believe as he buries this, it's going to be new. He's going to be new. Amen? Yes, amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for Brother Ronnie. Hold my arm, Brother Ronnie. 
And I thank you, Lord, for his commitment and his unwaver unwaveringness, Father, to you and to this church. I pray, God, that we'll bury this sickness, bury these worries, bury these concerns in the name of Jesus. And I count it an honor and a privilege to baptize him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you will, let's stand this morning. And as we stand, I know your hands are probably raw from clapping, but I think the Lord deserves a great hand clap of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you see any of those that were baptized this morning, let them know how proud of them you are. Pray for them. Pray. And family, let me tell you, if you, if you were here to see them baptized, one thing you can do for them, encourage them. Yes. Encourage them. Because the enemy's going to fight them even harder. Yes. The enemy is going to do everything he can to minimize their dedication and minimize this moment. But he's a loser. Do you believe the devil's a loser? Yes. So we need to help these individuals overcome him by what? The blood of the lamb and, and the word of our testimony. Yes. Encourage them. It's instill in them life and pray for them daily. If you feel comfortable in doing so, take somebody by the hand, lay a hand on the shoulder. We're going to pray for you. We're going to bless you. When I finish praying, you're going to be dismissed. And we pray that you have a wonderful week and that you're protected. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for this, these moments. God, I, I, I'm so full today. I'm so honored, Father, to be, have partaken in these moments with these seven individuals. Father, today I pray that you would instill power, instill vigor, instill life in them, Lord Jesus. And God, build them up in the most holy faith and help us as family and church members to encourage them, to empower them, and to, and to fill them with the word of God and prayer. Father, I pray over everybody in this sanctuary. I pray for each and every one of them to be blessed. I pray for their bodies to be healed. I pray for their spirits to be set free. I pray for their families to be restored. And I pray God for whatever they have need of today, that God, you would do it by your holy power and God do it and fill them with joy. Father, I pray that you would let them have a blessed week. I pray that you would send your angels charge over them today. Hedge them in before and behind, Lord. And God, I ask that you would bless them and keep them. Make your face shine upon them and be gracious unto them. Turn your countenance towards them, Lord, and give them peace. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. Before you go, I want to let you know I love you. If you ever need us, we're here. And don't forget the fall festival meeting right after everybody's gone. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. God bless you.